And now we'll um, move into our next phase of the program. That's our 2020 Digital Health Perspectives panel. And uh, I'm really pleased we'll turn it over to uh, Jillian, who's going to moderate the session for us. So Jillian is um, an assistant professor of education at the University of Victoria. She has a PhD in educational psychology from Simon Fraser University, a master's and a bachelor of education from the University of Alberta, and a postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard University. Uh, Jillian is co-chair of the Oversight and Advisory Committee for Patient Voices Network, a patient partner on the Shared, Shared Care Committee, member of the Steering Committee for Cardiac Services BC, and a public member of the Medical Services Commission. Jillian is also a heart failure survivor and transplant recipient, keynote speaker and blogger, and a co-founder of Heart Life Foundation. So welcome, Jillian. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you to Canada Health InfoWave for having me here today at this important event. Uh, first things first, um, I am of English, Irish, and Scottish ancestry, and I wish to acknowledge the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississauga, and the many Indigenous peoples uh, from across Turtle Island on, Island on whose territories we are meeting today. So, it's the year 2020. And all Canadians are using digital health to actively participate in managing their health and wellness. 2020 isn't far away, but how far away are we to that vision? And what will it take for us to get there? For myself and for other patients, I'm sure I can say that for us to really become true partners in our own care, we need to become empowered and we need to be empowered by our physicians and by the medical community to really help us manage and take back the responsibility of our own health. And one of the things that's really critical in making this happen is having access to our own information and our own health data. And it's critical for, the, for successful outcomes. Um, I am a result of that people-powered health that uh, Sheila was just talking about. And one of the reasons why I am, why I survived and why I'm standing here before you today with a heart transplant um, is because I was enabled by my physicians and by my team. And one of the ways that we did that, um, or that I, helped, that I helped myself do that, was through using digital health. So really, it, they could become life-saving outcomes. So I'm going to introduce the panel, um, and I'm not actually moderating, um, although I would love to stay up here all afternoon. Um, as I'm sure you'd love to have me. Um, but I'm going to introduce uh, Fraser Ratsford, and he is the Group Director of Consumer Health and Innovation at Canada Health Impaway, and he's today's panel moderator. With more than 25 years' experience in digital health, Fraser has been involved in a diverse range of healthcare in initiatives from implementing solutions to developing provincial health information and technology strategies. So no small feat. Uh, I think I'll ask you to come up as I introduce you. So welcome, Fraser. Next, we have Gary Laxall. And Gary brings the important patient perspective to the panel today. He's a retired business owner, and he worked in the telecommunications telecommu and computer industry for over 27 years. He's a passionate student of the game of golf and averages over 100 rounds per year. His other hobbies include hunting and spending time at his lodge near Rocky Mountain House in Alberta. Gary was diagnosed with stage one rectal cancer in 2015. And one year ago, after treatments, he had colostomy surgery. Now he's volunteering with Alberta Health Services and sits on the Surgical Strategic Clinical Network Board. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you here, Gary. Next we have Ahmad Zabib. Ahmad is the Executive Director of the Ontario Division of the Arthritis Society. Ahmad is a digital health expert with professional certification in healthcare information and management systems. He has hands-on experience in managing technology projects, which brings a unique perspective and expertise to his role, leading the Ontario Division on fundraising, mission implementation and operations. Ahmad previously worked for the Heart and Stroke Foundation for 10 years in various roles, including research implementation, patient education, and digital health strategy before, com before coming to the Arthritis Society in early 2016. So welcome, Ahmad. And finally, last but not least, we have Mark Kohler. 
Mark joins us today to provide his perspective on how market demand will move this vision. He brings over 29 years of senior executive strategy and venture funding experience to this perspective, where today he leads Accelerate Health's growth, uh, growth capital investing and innovation activities in the digital health sector. So welcome, and Fraser, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you. I'm not sure, Jillian, maybe you could actually do the, uh, be the better, better moderator here. Um, so uh, thank you for that great introduction and for sharing your story with us. And uh, we're now at the point in the um, afternoon where we're actually going to have a rapid fire presentation style from our three panelists here. And our vision statement is it's 2020 and all Canadians are using digital health to actively participate in managing their health and wellness. Each panelist is going to give you their sort of take on that statement. And um, this is when I'm encouraging you on the webcast, uh, you, those of you in the room, to fill out your cue cards, use the Q&A, uh, use the hashtag ThinkDigitalHealth, and ask questions, get the questions ready. Because after each of the five minute presentations, Presentations. We're then going to have a question period where we want to have that dialogue. And that's what it's all about, is having this digital health conversation, and we want everyone to be a part of it. So, Gary, we're going to start off with you. So uh, my timers are going to be watching the five-minute mark and uh, go to it. I could be in trouble here with the five minutes. So, again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and speak to you this afternoon. I'm, I'm honored, and this is a privilege to, uh, to be speaking to everybody. Uh, when I was first asked to speak about patients as partners, I you know, immediately thought uh, not so much of the digital role, I'll, I'll get to that, but I was thinking, what is the patient's role? And I think this is extremely uh, important. So when I was diagnosed with cancer, Immediately I was going, you know, after I got over the initial shock, I, I thought, well, there's two ways of looking at this. I could either take a, a reactive approach and just sit back and wait, and I said, no, that's, that's not the kind of guy I am. So I thought it was extremely imperative that I took an active role in my wellness, not my illness, but I wanted to be well and well again. And so I was immediately began researching and finding out what can I do to, to better prepare myself for my upcoming uh, treatments, my chemo, my uh, radiation, and ultimately my surgery. So what, uh, what I started doing is, you know, just kept on asking, what can I do to better prepare myself? And then I found out it wasn't just me, I wasn't just being reactionary, I was actually part of my medical team. And by being an integral part of my medical team means I was fully, you know, immersed. I wanted to be part of everything. I wanted to listen to all the options. My wife was with me and we just kept on asking questions. And I really felt as long as I was part of this medical team, I was in control of my own destiny and my own health and wellness. What we also did is, aside from the medical team, we also set up a personal support team. And this consisted of some family, uh, some close friends, family that was also in the medical profession, and believe it or not, my chocolate lab, Sammy. And, and I relied on my personal support team, as well as my medical team, to give me information and, again, just doing further research on the net. Uh, as far as my disease and about having, you know, a, a colostomy. That's, it's a big change. It's just a change of the plumbing, really. But, uh, you know, I really wanted to find out how I could uh, successfully get through and uh, become well again. So I started doing immense amounts of research, uh, whether it be on Google, uh, YouTube, Facebook, any information I was trying to absorb it all in and learn and uh, because I knew the more I had, uh, uh, the better shape I was going into my treatments and into my surgery, the better off I'd be coming out of it. 
So what I also did, uh, again, searching online, I was uh, looking for different groups. And I'm, I'm from Alberta. I'm from Calgary. And we have a, a wonderful Alberta Health Service has been nothing short of spectacular for me. But what I also found reaching out, there were many, many other groups online. And I found Wellspring. And there's a Wellspring in Toronto. Uh, it's a great welcoming community for cancer patients, caregivers, and bereavers. And uh, I learned a lot uh, from the programs online and in person that uh, all the peer groups and information that are available for patients. And again, it's about becoming empowered and engaged. And again, there is only one outcome and to me that was being successful. So what we found both with the medical teams and with all of the teams I've dealt with, and you'll notice when I talk to you here today and over the next couple of days at the conference, I'll be asking a lot of questions because that's the way I learn and it's not just uh, myself. We were, uh, my wife and I was, you know, we were strategic in writing down all our questions. When you're meeting with your surgeons and your clinicians, they only have a finite amount of time and then they say, okay, do you have any questions? Well, we went prepared to all of these meetings and just kept on asking questions and becoming more and more immersed in our, in our health, both digitally and, uh, you know, and in person. So with also continuing our role, I kept on asking, what can I do to better prepare myself for the surgery? And then I was introduced to a new procedure, a new program uh, called ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. And initially, I knew nothing about this. And when they told me, well, Gary, basically, for your colostomy surgery, you're going to be in the hospital anywhere from 7 to 21 days. I said, mm, not going to happen. And uh, so I said, what can I do to better prepare? So I took it upon myself to uh, increase my exercise role. I had to golf more games. But uh, no, I, in all seriousness, it was, it was increasing uh, carbohydrate diets and just uh, looking after myself and doing a lot more exercise. And this absolutely helped me on my uh, care pathway and helped me on my upcoming procedure. So as, as Michael and Sheila definitely said, when patients are engaged and self-managing their care, they are empowered. And this is not, it's not just a statistic. This is the absolute God-given truth. The more we are engaged, the better off we'll all be. And especially as I sing to uh, Sarah and Laura at lunch, in that especially men, guys have, you know, they like to keep things inside of themselves. And I'm not one of those guys. I like to talk about the issues, talk about the situations, again, asking questions. And the more we learn about our situation, helps us control our own destiny and feel more empowered. Uh, one of the things I also found through Wellspring is by practicing wellness. Uh, I, I still practice uh, mindfulness, meditation, and relaxation, and visualization. And uh, there's many, many online apps. In fact, I, I was listening to one last night. So it's, uh, again, by practicing mindfulness, helps patients better cope and remain positive throughout their journeys. And uh, uh, there are many, many of these programs out there, and I highly recommend them. Um, one thing I do recommend is seeking a medical team that endorses using digital health. Uh, real life example, as, as Sheila was saying, I was sitting down with my general physician and going through all of, uh, we use NetCare in Alberta as, as our EMR, and sitting down with my, with my physician, and she's going through my CT scans with me, going through my blood tests and all my results. And yes, at the beginning, I didn't quite understand it, but the more questions you ask, the better you become at understanding your own care and your own destiny. And so this is where I highly recommend uh, not using the paper files, going with people uh, who you know, endorse digital health and uh, your outcomes will be a lot better. So we, uh, Sheila had mentioned before about you know, practical examples of this already at work in Canada. Well, in Al Alberta, I would say most of our physicians use net care. Not all of them, um, but most of them do. And it's our electronic health record that shows your diagnostic imaging, your records, test results, everything that we've talked about before. And so this is happening now. Is it 100% adopted? No, it is not. Um, you know, there are, it's, it's all about information and communication. 
Some people in the medical industry choose to still use paper records, and, and I had a former doctor, that's exactly what she used, and, uh, but we we're all moving. It's all information, communication, and uh, it's the digital age. So as I mentioned before uh, about ERAS, and so our patients are partnering with our healthcare providers and true partnerships, not just, not just word of mouth uh, or, or you know, giving you lip service, uh, but by actively being involved in your care, especially with enhanced recovery after surgery, has especially helped me. And uh, as I said, I was told I was going to be in the hospital up to 21 days, and I was out in day six. I would have left in day five had they let me, but uh, <laughs> it kept me in for an extra day. Um, one thing that I found extremely helpful, again, I was researching information about you know how to best prepare for my surgery and the one nice thing Alberta Health Services had were these 10 YouTube like videos and I watched these faithfully and it was about the anesthetist here's what you can expect here's what your pre-admission clinic here's what the charged nurse on your ward will uh, be telling you about and I was going good this is this is really good the only thing that I thought was missing was a patient perspective. It would have been nice to have a patient going, well, Gary, this is, this is, what you're, this, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, I recommend bringing an extension cord for your iPad because the plug-in may be a little far away. Or bring a back scratcher, not to scratch your back, but maybe to reach things on your tray. But, uh, again, I found these really, really helpful. And, again, just by researching online, assisted me greatly in that. Um, the one thing I am very proud of, I'm, I'm a patient advisor with Alberta Health Services on a couple of their strategic clinical networks. And uh, there is a new beta tool. It was supposed to be out already, but uh, HS is developing their own personal health record available for the patients. We've been talking about patient records. Uh, I want to know that information. Do I understand it all? No, but it's, it's just information. It's communication. And I feel if I have control of that or being a part of that, it's only going to help my wellness on a going forward basis. So we are seeing this uh, as well. There is a brand new surgical app. I wish this would have been out when I was going through my surgery last November. But a uh, new surgery app, and especially for ERAS patients, where we can push information out to the patients on fasting, uh, what exercise you need, what to do before the day before your surgery, or what to do when you're out and you're back home recuperating. Oh. Okay, so again, further, I'll just uh, quickly wrap up here. So examples that are going to drive progress in this area. Um, we talked about the patient portal. The personal health record is nice. The, the, and I come from an IT background, and I understand the complexities of taking hundreds of systems and wrapping them into one. There are, it's, it's, it's a mind-boggling event, but we will get there by working together, and the patient portal is absolutely uh, first and foremost in that area. I'd like to go further and say, as Sheila had mentioned, that we'd like to see this nationally and not just, not just provincially, because wouldn't it be nice to have a fully portable electronic health record that, geez, maybe I'm moving from Alberta and I'm going to have my surgery in New Brunswick, or maybe I want to have my surgery at Camby in Vancouver, or go down to the Mayo Clinic in Minneapolis. It's my information, I'd like my records, and uh, again, it's just information and communication. And just to wrap up, uh, Alberta Health Services has adopted a patient-focused, patient-first attitude. Uh, in the year 2020, it would be nice if every single health board across Canada was on the same wavelength and treated patients as their partners. And last is digital stories. Uh, with digital stories, we did a pilot project in Alberta on patient digital stories. Back to my YouTube videos, we feel that digital stories from patients helping other patients is absolutely an empowering uh, methodology and an important message going forward. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that, Gary. And now um, I'm hoping that lots was coming in on the Twitter feed and through our webcast. Those of you should be writing down questions. So uh, Gary will uh, we'll make sure we ask Gary some questions at the end. But now I'm going to turn it over to Ahmed. Thank you. So, uh, 
I was just looking at the questions when Sheila sent me in uh, in terms of putting the session and at the beginning I was like, ah, there's not enough information in there and um, usually we're used to getting clear information. This is not, it's, there's, a good, there's a good story here. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and then, it, but it got me thinking. It got me thinking to go beyond the traditional way we think and, you know, I, I just want to take you through uh, some of the learnings that um, I've uh, gathered over the years in terms of how do you approach designing solutions and thinking digital, but also I want to take you through a, a dream of mine. So I'm, I'm going to travel back from year 2020 and talk to you about what I just experienced shortly. So let's just start with key principles of digital and, and digital health, whatever it is you're designing, even design principles, because that applies for anything you're doing. The first thing that we should focus on always is the target audience. Before we talk about the solution, let's not talk find problems for solutions. Let's actually find people, learn about who they are, who we want to focus on, move on to their pain points, and learn more about what is it that really you know, bothers them on a daily basis. And then instead of coming up with the most convoluted solution, come up with the simplest way of solving one problem at a time. Test that with real life people, not just with your neighbors. Not that your neighbors are not real life people, but just they might not be that target audience. And then go through this everlasting feedback loop of iterations of learning, you know, how do people, what people are telling you, but also how people are interacting with the solution providing. And then make sure that the technology is seamless, because if you can see the technology, you have failed. So I just want to share with you some of the pain points from you know, my, my experience. You know. uh, luckily, I do have a primary care provider, but I've, I've met people who don't have a primary care provider. And it's hard, actually, to find a primary care provider, depending where you are in Canada. Um, I can't see my doctor soon enough. You know, I've got the flu. I call my doctor and say, yeah, I'll see you in three weeks. Well, guess what? In three weeks, my flu will be over. Um, I've been in pain for the last three years. Uh, I have a family member of mine who's been in pain for the last nine years. And nobody seems to know how to deal with it. You know, it's just it's not my problem. Um, you know, I have my lab test completed, but I haven't heard back. And it really worries me. Um, you know, usually the general rule, if you don't hear back, it's good news. But try telling that to my mind. Um, I pay way too much for a parking when I go to the hospital. Uh, you know, if you live in the GTA, you, you can relate. Um, and last time I called my doctor, true story, 15 minutes waiting to connect. And all I wanted to do is rebook an appointment. So let's just imagine together. You know, I just came back today from year 2020, and I've moved to a small town. And I just received an email from a local health authority welcoming me to this new region. And um, they, in the email, they're asking for permission to access my file, it's hosted somewhere in the cloud. And in that email as well, they're asking me to select a local healthcare provider who's accepting patient. Um, after choosing the doctor on the list, and I made sure that I chose a doctor, actually, or a nurse practitioner, who has great reviews for family with, with young kids, because it is personal to me. I just don't want to choose what's available. I want to choose what's available, what's going to work for me. And, um, you know, I, I was prompted to set up an appointment to get my, my family, you know, and uh, in the prompt, I, I got the option of going online or in person. After connecting with a video conference with a doctor, I was offered to join an online pain management workshop, big, uh, a group that is actually offered by the Arthritis Society. And I was assigned a pain care team as well. My doctor suggested I get a blood test. And there was a prompt on my screen at the end of the visit to book an appointment in a nearby lab. And once I signed up, uh, sorry, this is, I'm jet lagged, by the way. For, for those of you I was telling you I'm not jet lagged, I'm so jet lagged. <laughs> so I went to the lab, I had my blood test, and you know, in the afternoon I got an email at the same time that my doctor got a notification that the results are there and I don't have anything to worry about. And by the way, the doctor's not gonna contact me because the results are within normal range. So there was some contextual information. So, if you've noticed here, I didn't really talk about solutions. I talked about my experience. And technology was a big part of it, but it wasn't the main course. So that's, this is what designing, designing um, digital should be. Um, 
or storing this. So thinking about what are current solutions available right now, like I actually went to uh, um, the lab recently and I, I received my results and I was ecstatic. Mind you, I have, I have a background in medicine, so I understand the results, but I also was happy to see the normal ranges in there. And I didn't wait for the doctor to call me and say, hey, there's something wrong because I, I was able to read it. Um, the other thing is, I know that we're working on e-booking. Unfortunately, my doctor still doesn't have it, and I, I'm seriously considering changing doctors to somebody who have e-booking because it is a headache getting through. So I know there's a, there are a lot of solutions, but the problem is it does not weave into my life. If there are bits and pieces here and there that some doctor might have one solution or you know, a hospital might have a solution, it's just not complete. So and this is my opinion totally, and what I think the driving factors here are there's empowering patients. You know, there's, as you heard, patients want to be active. They want to be part of the process. They really want to you know, be involved in it. Um, there's the digital natives. Digital natives are actually now are starting to care for their young ones and for their parents. So they're entering the healthcare system. And these guys are going to, and gals, going to disrupt the healthcare system. Because they know what does it look, feel like to get great customer service. You know what, I, I just called Apple yesterday. And it was a phenomenal experience. I went online, I put my email, they called me, said, what, when is the best time to call you? And then they started diagnostic on my phone. And before I know it, I have an appointment on Sunday to go and change my phone. I mean, isn't that what we should expect from now on? So, and this whole thing about, you know, we don't pay for healthcare when we actually do, it means that we should, are we okay with the subpar health experience? And then there's this whole thing about disruption. Everybody's talking about disruption. Disruption is cool. And digital natives are looking for things to do. So I'm very, very hopeful that healthcare actually is going to be disrupted by, by everybody. So as far as priorities going forward, I think um, thinking of the patients and public as customers and treating them accordingly is, is going to be key. Uh, democratizing the data. So give me access to my data in the format that is usable to me, not just a printout or a paper copy. And democratizing problem solving. And InfoA is starting to do some of these challenges. Open up the problems to the public because the collective wisdom is much stronger, much, much higher than you might find from a group of experts. And then apply principles of privacy by design. But don't use privacy as a scapegoat of why you can't do something. I know, you know, sometimes they build systems that are so tight and so private that even the people who need to use it can't access it. What's it good for? So. This is, this is basically it. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're actually going to be in 2020 in a much, much better position. Hopefully it won't cost us as much as well. Thank you, Ahmed. So very thought provoking and definitely a vision of 2020. So again, I encourage all of you on our webcast um, to use the hashtag Think Digital Health, put your questions in. Christina is uh, collating them all at the back. But last but not least, we're going to invite Mark up and he's going to give you his thoughts. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking about, very briefly, about uh, market demand and um, my perspectives on market demand as it relates to digital health. Um, if we talk about a market, or I think of a market, I think of customers and I think about providers of uh, a service or providers of technology, but providers of a technology enabled by capital flows, investors. So I sit with this picture and I was uh, allowed to say anything I want actually up here. <laughs> um, I, I sit with this picture before us um, and I look at our world in, in digital health and healthcare and, and internationally, but also locally here in Ontario. and I. I want us to all think of a few things. One is it's a highly complex world. And when we think about healthcare, or when I think about healthcare, I try to figure out where I fit and where an investor might fit and where a company providing technologies might fit. So it's very complex. So as a quick reminder, we could be talking about acute care today in the hospital setting. I could talk about home care. Um, I could talk about, you know, the care of my father who's 90 years old. He lives at home very happily, doesn't need that service yet, but will probably very soon. 
Um, we can talk about primary care, the doctors, the physicians, the, uh, the uh, clinics that are using technology. You know, the classic is the electronic medical records uh, systems, the EMRs. We could talk about pharmacy. We could talk about the chains. We could talk about dispensing in a long-term care facility, in the community, at my local pharmacy. We know the brands. I, won't, I don't need to name them. Remote monitoring. It's a tracking of activity, a tracking of data. Um, virtual care, telemedicine, um, e-visits, um, e-consults, um, using Skype-like technologies to have people uh, communicate with each other, clinicians and, and patients. I can go on and on. There's data and system interoperability. There's self-management and wellness. Let's, book, you know, let's put all that together. Um, Precision medicine, we can go on and on and on. I, I'm happy to hear about other, other areas, but what does it get down to? For, for me, it's, it's on the customer side. I'm trying to uh, look forward to in 2020. I'm looking forward to technologies that are enabling, enabling all those different settings in healthcare to, to deliver better. Um, I'm looking for technology to be innovative. And with a requirement that we sit and document, again, what is innovation? And in my world, innovation is not a brand new revolutionary invention or a new patent. It's simply another new improved way of doing things, accessing technologies that are probably already there and just bringing them together in a, in a better way. Um, I also look at technology as a driver of value. And um, why is it valuable? Because it drives um, positive patient outcomes, hopefully at the end, as a customer. Then I, then I look at the, the market demand subject, and I say, who is the customer on one side, right? Is it the government? Does the payer? And it is oftentimes here. And we're quite reliant on our governments and our health authorities to maybe take a leading step and give direction to where we should um, uh, build or buy more technology. It's not always the right way to look at it. The customer could be the clinician, the expert in the field, the navigator. The customer could be you and I as the consumer, as the person in need of, of health services. So think about that. Again, it's not that complex, but on the customer side, on the demand side, um, we have to know who is going to buy, who's going to procure this technology. Um, if I carry on with a little bit of that vein, I'm getting closer to the middle between consumer and supplier here. Digital health is dependent on trust in the system. And Sheila did a great job talking about uh, one of our concerns or one of our, our uh, needs is to um, ensure privacy and data security is robust. Um, if you ask me, what's my perspective? I look at privacy and I say, you know what, this is not that difficult. Um, the privacy issues before us have been legislated, they're regulated, they've been well thought through. They do change every now and then, but they are there. And what we have to do is ensure that technology providers, companies, understand those uh, regulations and are able to drive through them and um, have them become competitive advantages. In, built into their technologies. I also look at the world as investment in and use of technology can be viewed as a risk management initiative. My, part of my background is I was CFO of a, of a bank here in Canada. And in, in the banking industry, one of the biggest uh, issues to concern yourself with is risk management. You're trying to create practices and procedures that will protect the depositor, right? You and I that deposit money into banks. In healthcare, it could be um, a way of in ensuring that the technology protects us, um, delivers higher returns for the same inputs, and reduces all that waste and error and mistakes and leakage uh, on the one side as well. So that's kind of the customer side. If I look at mark demand and I look at the investor side, and that's where I live um, for at least my professional life, we're, we're, uh, I'm part of a fund called Accelerate Capital, and we focus on healthcare technology businesses, um, investing in healthcare technology businesses. One of them was, and this is a personal perspective, was QHR, 
QHR, um, if you don't know, uh, was a supplier of an EMR system under a brand called Acuro, a national player, publicly listed company. Uh, you and I could have owned that company any day of the week, except three weeks ago it was purchased by Loblaws so that they could use that technology and that know-how in their um, pharmacy side of their business and their consumer engagement, let's call it, not just patient engagement, but consumer engagement side. So for five years, we looked at that business, and I was a board member, and we revisited its supply and provision of technology in the marketplace. And we changed it every now and then. We changed its strategy. We uh, brought it more to uh, be focused as a navigator, a navigator technology that's used by clinicians physicians. That was the focus. We thought, thought that was very, very valuable at the time. In 2014, early 2014, we reset the strategy and decided that we would also um, ensure that technology was engaging consumers. And we bought Medio Health um, from Victoria or Vancouver, and that's a virtual care system. And we drove um, that business to uh, provide um, useful technology again, for its customers, as we defined it. Um, in its last months or quarters, it started to deliver returns, uh, financial returns, which meant that customers were buying it, that, which meant that it, really, it satisfied a real market need at the time. And then it was purchased by a, a large corporate, as we, uh, we may or may not know, which is Loblaws now. Um, if I look at... Again, another way of looking at market demand, and I'm almost done, guys, don't worry. I look at, we have a variety of ways of measuring an investment. This is one way. It's a very uh, user-friendly way. And it goes from the top. It, it, it demands of our, of our investee companies to define a target market, so a size of a market, or is it growing, or is the customer well-defined? I keep talking about customers, and it's really, really important when you build technology or or create strategies for technology that you actually understand who the customer and the user is going to be. Okay, it's very, very important to us. We walk down the, uh, or go around the cycle here, and we have impact. And impact is really, again, is the need real in the marketplace? Is this company going to provide something that's uh, satisfying a real need? The solution, is it, is it better? I'll use the word better. Is the solution better than another one? Uh, the promise, um, is it feasible? Does it have any innovation in it on the technology side? The competitive landscape, is this thing, is our competitive landscape changing? Is it staying the same? Um, do we know what, what, who the competitors are and why are they successful or not so successful? In QHR's uh, world, one of our biggest competitors became TELUS that bought different disparate EMR systems and were trying to provide the same service to uh, physicians ultimately. Um, and finally, it's the revenue model at the, near the top there. It's the cash flow. And it's how will the technology be purchased by the customer? And will it be valuable to the customer again? Will it be um, something that a customer is willing to pay for at all? Or do they think it should be free? Right? So we look at all that, come out the other end with a, with a, a value of an enterprise or a value of a technology and we decide to invest or not. Hopefully we're deciding to invest more than not invest because we're in 2020 and we've suddenly become successful in, in all of digital health. Um, and so I, I can imagine that there's organizations like ours that have invested heavily in the technology side, digital health. And I'll leave, I'll leave you with this. This is interesting. This is me speaking at an annual general meeting, shareholders meeting in early 2014, a while ago. Um, I'm still proud of this quote because um, I think even in 2016, we've still got some room to keep growing with this, this thought. But let me read it for you. And it says, in quotes, and I believe innovation is to be accessed more often now outside of an acute care setting, the hospital, and more and more in primary care, physicians and clinicians, and in the community, home care and virtual care and in other consumer settings. An imperative to digital health innovation is the concept of patient engagement. It's the user again I'm talking about. Patient engagement, or something I call bridging technology to care. 
So that's, I think, what we're going to be talking about over the next few days here, and it, and it does, it is central to digital health, and I hope you see that this statement will probably outlast me. Um, it will be evolutionary, and there will be add-ons and benefits to it, but, but it still stay, holds true. It still holds true yesterday, today, and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so very thought-provoking uh, uh, talks from each of our three panelists. And I know they're eager to answer your questions. So they've set out a broad or you know, uh, an impressive vision for 2020. Do people challenge that vision? Do you have some questions for our panelists? Uh, Christina, I know you've been uh, monitoring the Twitter feed and the webcast questions. Is there something to start with um, that you want to get us going? Uh, there's one sort of common theme coming through around the informed, powered patient to get to the end vision. Uh, can the panelists speak from their perspective of uh, what's holding back getting to this state of uh, patient participation? All right. Well, as a patient, do you want to start first? Sure. I'll start. Well, as I mentioned earlier, especially for men, uh, you know, dealing with some, some serious illnesses, it's, it's tough to get talking about that. And so the more information that is available to us, the better. And it's a collective sharing, uh, sharing online, sharing, as I mentioned earlier, it's information and communication. And I think that's the only thing that's holding us back is uh, not keeping it a deep, dark secret. Let's talk about cancer. Let's talk about rectal surgery. You know, unfortunately, one in 14 Canadians get told they have uh, colon cancer, and, and that's a staggering amount. And it's, I think, just talking about it more, having everything, whether it be, you know, talking about it through Facebook, through LinkedIn, through all of our social medias. Today, we're using some of these social media platforms. Who knows what we're going to be using in 2024 when we talk about this again? But I think just talking about the issues and getting it out and uh, just talking, communicating, and being more informative. Great, thank you. Ahmad, you set a definite sort of vision and what you expect to experience uh, in 2020. So what do you think are some of those things that may not get us there or what's standing in the way? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to think about the population in different segments. And I'm not your average kind of, uh, yeah, you know, um, Canadian because of my background. I'm a technology geek. I, you know, this is the stuff that I'm actually looking forward to. There are people, and you know, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with psych, psychologists and psychiatrists and behavior change and applying technology for that. We usually speak about people being in different stages of change for different lifestyle or managing their conditions. So, and the stages go from your pre-contemplation, you're in contemplation, you're into you know, taking action, preparation, taking action, and relapse. And people could be at any given moment at a different stages, and there are reasons why you could be in one of the stages or the other one. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is also that we humans are constantly trying to avoid the very, very, you know, future, long future. Um, I think Daniel Kahneman, one of the, you know, Nobel um, um, winners, uh, Nobel Prize winners, a uh, psychologist, uh, talked about, you know, when we actually focus, when, when you ask somebody to change their behavior, constantly looking at the consequences of changing their behavior now, not in the future. So that also plays an important role, whether I'm actually going to open up my door and learn about the condition or not. Or, you know, the case where somebody's blood pressure, blood sugar is not being managed because my wife just diagnosed with cancer and I have so many other things. So it is important that we think about the population, not at just a patient. There are multiple segments in there. And the beauty of technology, it actually allows us to address um, and personalize the intervention once we actually start digging up what are those segments and what are their wants and needs. Okay. And those segments kind of re lead nicely into market demand. So from a market demand standpoint, um, what do you well, think? It, it's, um, it could be as cold-hearted as this. It could be, you know, we're, we'd have to look at how to prioritize where the, uh, the biggest benefit is. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and in, in ensuring that patients are engaged or, or communicated with. So, I mean, it's making your bets. Sometimes it's um, figuring out what part of the industry you want to um, uh, pick as becoming a winner. Um, 
and supporting that, that organization or that technology. Um, but more on a, on a patient side, you know, I, mean, I think we're all patients ultimately in some shape or form. And, and let me tell you from my perspective, I, have, um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis about 10 years ago. And, you know, it's being managed. And ironically, you're sitting beside me, Mr. Arthritis Society. Um, um, but, and it's not, you know, that difficult uh, a chronic disease to handle. However, it does change over time. And what I've appreciated as a patient or a, a user of the system is uh, my doctor, my physician. She's a specialist. She uses an EMR, which, by the way, was ours, um, which is really cool. Um, but you know, the drugs that, you know, are being prescribed, you know, it's, it's efficient because I know how to ask about it, I guess, but also um, understanding the effect on my body through the, the blood tests and the lab results and the electronic reports that come to me. As an individual in Canada, I can get that stuff right now. And I find that extremely helpful. Um, and it's me having to try to piece the, bring the pieces together. It's not done for me. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to do it myself because that's just the way I am. Um, but for others, I'm not so sure they, they should have to right. you know, struggle through that. Right? So you used an example in your presentation about banking. Um, and so yeah. how come banking's got there but healthcare hasn't? Well, uh, well um, because um, healthcare is very, very, very personal. Right. Personal beyond, you know, how much money you uh, have in loans or whatever, you know. Um, there's sensitivities in healthcare data and um, there's sharing and, and, and that. And it's, it's quite, quite a bit more sensitive, I think. Right, right. right? Yeah. Not quite as easy. Um, are there any questions on our cue cards or anyone want to come up to the mic? Lori, please. Uh, Lori Poole from OTN. Uh, I just want to thank you for your presentations and your insights. And I, I think it's more of a comment that I just, um, I think we need to think about when we think about digital health, um, is that we're probably speaking to a very educated group uh, in this room. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that equity uh, is very important uh, in healthcare and is a challenge. So as we start to look at innovation, we look at scalability. Um, how do we ensure we're meeting those needs of those individuals that um, face many barriers, you know, in healthcare, be it poverty, be it cultural, be it language uh, barriers? I just want to call that out, uh, whether or not you have any insights, and uh, just to keep that in mind when we're thinking about uh, digital health and uh, scaling uh, these solutions. Thanks. Very important. Anyone want to? I'm happy to, to take a shot here. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's extremely important that we keep in mind that particular one. This is Canada and you know uh, equity is top of mind for 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 all Canadians and that's uh, that's evident. Um, it, it's also important to keep in mind that the cost of technology is actually going down and and, and access to technology well maybe let me paraphrase that cost of technology maybe is not overall going down but access to technology is going down so um, when I when I actually get uh, a WhatsApp message from my grandmother who doesn't really want to invest in a cell phone <laughs> And she calls me by mistake at two o'clock in the morning because she's playing Candy Crush. <laughs> you know, it's just there's there's a there's been a generation where they skipped access using desktops, and now they're on on mobile phones and tablets. So access technology is not as a problem as it used to be. Recognizing there are still remote populations, and uh, you know, someone for example on on reserves with First Nations, they, you know, internet might be patchy. You always need to have a program that will serve the needs of the minorities, but also you shouldn't penalize the majority by not providing you know, solutions that will work for everybody. So uh, it, that's just my two cents. I think delivering healthcare services, um, not in a clinical setting, but more in the community and driving it out into the community uh, might help in accessibility and, and, and in also including um, social determinants of health and in our thinking and the way we provide healthcare, right? So it's that movement to community. How, what is that? I mean, it's hard to say, but it could be as simple as the, the, the physician is actually knowing and speaking and, and aware of what's happening in my father's house as he's, he's getting home care services, senior care services, right? Or, or others are, are accessing um, the community health centers 
right? And there's data, and maybe those patients aren't going to the same place every single time, but there's a movement of that information. Maybe that creates more accessibility, but it's driving it into the community is, is going to be very important, I think. I think it's, uh, as well, that's a great point, Mark, is, is asking the patients what they want. You know, asking for their opinion, asking if they want to be engaged, and nine times out of ten, they will say, yes, I want to be engaged. If you give patients that option, it's, it's great having all the technology and all these tools available, but if they don't know about it, they're not going to use it. Now, are, are all patients going to use all the technologies? No, my 84-year-old mother is not going to go on her own personal health care record, but I am, the millennials are, like I said, it's information technology. Let us know about it, and you know, it's, it's if you build it, they will come. Not to to coin an old phrase, but give us the information and let us choose what we want to use, and you'll be surprised how many people pick up the ball and run with it. Right, and I also think uh, from another point of view that digital won't remain the only channel. So, Ahmad, in your case, where you said you were waiting 15 minutes on the phone to get through to your physician's office, well, if more people could electronically book, your call would probably be answered much quicker. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's those people, as you said, your grandmother may be the one that continues to call in, but if we can shift some of that access to some of the digital resources, then it opens up the traditional channels uh, to, have, to allow more access as well. Uh, Christina, you've got something back there. Yeah, I have a question that builds off of the patient experience you're just talking about. How can we convince industry and service providers of the value of the patient input in developing digital health products? I think we're doing it right now, but uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll let each of our panelists uh, uh, respond to that question. Well, I'll go back to just ask us. Uh, patients do want to get engaged. Uh, you know, we are quickly coming into the year 2020, and we have these tools. We want to utilize them. We all want to be part, not just on managing our illness, but we want to be well. And we're going to use whatever tools we can to grow with and learn from these experiences, and as well share these experiences digitally with other people uh, as a patient advocate, as an advisor, because we want other people to learn and to uh, get this information out and share it. Anything yeah, I, I, I think the market is going to correct itself to balance with you in this case, because if you don't actually engage patients, then you're going to be obsolete soon. You know, everybody outside the healthcare industry is doing it. Some new players are playing now, starting to do that in healthcare. You know, you will have to do it soon, otherwise, goodbye. Anything to add to that, no, Mark? No, that's no. fine. That's truly listening to your market by listening to what the patient wants and engaging them. Ms. Maloney, you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Um, just to, this is sort of to build on that, that previous question and, and some of the questions that we had earlier is around, you know, clinicians and attitudes and cultures and, and how do you engage patients. And I'm just wondering, Gary, or from the patient perspective of any of the other panelists, have you come across, you talked about your former doctor um, not allowing, not having an EMR or not allowing you to do something. So did you make a conscious decision to change providers or and did you tell him or her that you were changing and why and have you ever come across um, an instance or do you have examples of where clinicians are not receptive to the patient voice and and what did you do and what was the circumstance great question great question so i'll give you two examples um not having uh, uh, using an emr uh, was one of the reasons why i changed my physician but, uh, you know, it was, it was one of many reasons, actually. Uh, it was definitely a, a strong one. But I just felt, you know, my, my needs weren't being addressed. And uh, coming from business, I, I always like to put myself in the customer's perspective, you know. And I, I don't just think of myself as a patient. I think of us as customers. And I didn't think my needs were being met. And it's much like what I found out very quickly in business. If you're not meeting your customers' needs, they're going to go elsewhere. 
uh, a second example, and, and uh, it was my very first meeting uh, sitting on the surgical uh, SCN board with Alberta Health Services. Uh, we were talking about marketing and branding, and some of the surgeons got up and said, well, we don't need this. You know, we don't need a, a Twitter account or a Facebook account. And their, their first uh, time meeting with me, and I hope I didn't really blow it, but I just said, don't, don't be Nortel. Don't forget, Nortel, in my opinion, forgot who their customers were. And I said, it's just about information and communication. Listen to your customers. And as Ahmed had said, you know, if you don't listen to your customers, you're not going to be here. And so that's, uh, you know, I got a, a bit of a, a shocked reaction from some of the surgeons in the rooms. But really, I just went on to say, you know, I don't mean to be offensive, but it's just communication. It's just information. And we are your customers. Your customers aren't the higher-ups or the VPs within Alberta Health Services. It's your customers. And uh, by engaging your patients today, it just makes them more empowered, and the outcomes are just going to be fantastic. That's true. I think we, um, we all have the uh, sort of thought that, oh, well, we've been in the patient's shoes. Um, and sometimes we think, well, that's a good enough um, sort of reflection of what other patients may want, but it's not always this case because it is a personal view, but we need to engage as many people as we can to find out what is that true need and what is that market um, so that we can design the road to 2020 in, in a much better way. Uh, Christina, are there some more questions coming in? Uh, nothing right now. All right. Well, please generate those questions in the room if you've got anything on a card or are feeling you want to come up to the mic please do so. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, we want to continue this dialogue. Um, so in 2020, uh, you each sort of set out a vision of, of what you thought uh, we might get to. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, will we get there? Based on what you know now, are we going to get there? I'm going to start this time with Mark and come this way. Um, I'm going to be a positive thinker here, and uh, yeah, we're definitely going to get there. We are definitely going to get there. We have we have the cornerstones of decision making. We know that there's technology, if it's not right in our backyard, maybe it's not in you know in in our region, um, it's somewhere. I mean, we have the ability to reach to. I'm going to be in New York in two weeks, and we're and we're going to be talking about you know e-health. Again, and it will be. I'll be looking at technologies that may be a year and a half ahead of what we would have ever dreamt about. Um, in a year and a half, it'll be mainstream, and that's what's been going on, right? In technology, that's one of the benefits of being in this sector is that it moves very quickly, high velocity, and, and good things uh, um, stay, right? So, I think we're going to be there. I think we can. Um, uh, we were talking about the t at the table. We can be less shy about admitting that we saw something somewhere, and we saw that it could work. And guess what we did? We copied it and brought it home. And we don't have to reinvent it. And if we do that more often than not, I, I think we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm hopeful. Well, I'm I'm I am very positive and hopeful as well and I, because I, it's, I truly believe in what Henry Ford said. If you think you can or you can't, then you're right. And the only way we can get there is if we believe that we can get there. In my opinion, I, I, I want to say with bated breath in, and being positive, I'm a very positive guy, I think we'll be there in certain uh, instances. Our personal health records, yes, I know we're going to be there in Alberta for sure in 2020 having that. Are they going to be fully portable electronic health records that I can go globally uh, and share them? I don't think we'll get that far, but again, sharing information, having the records available for the patients, that absolutely I feel we, feel we will very much be there. Well, I'm confident if all of our panelists say we're going to get there, that we definitely are. <laughs> we are going to get there, and uh, certainly uh, at InfoWay, we're going to help push uh, us in getting in that right direction. Um, I, again, encourage anyone on the floor to um, ask any questions. We have a few minutes left. We want to keep this dialogue going, tap the uh, important brains of these individuals up here, and uh, make sure we uh, answer your questions or if they've uh, sort of provoked a thought in you. 
We do have a question. Um, thank you very much for the whole panel. Uh, you kind of represent an interesting continuum. Uh, we've got capital flow, an innovator who wants to build things, and the end user all sitting right beside each other. Um, and so we've talked a lot about what the vision is in 2020 for how we're using systems, but I wonder if you could also speak to uh, your ideal version in 2020 of how the essential players like yourselves are collaborating to keep improving and keep going forward. Who wants to start? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think we need another session just to draw the vision for that. Uh, I think it is essential because you, you kind of hit it on the head. It is essential for the whole ecosystem to be working towards that vision to, you know, make sure that people who have problems, uh, they have the podium to, to voice the problems and they're heard and that people who like to tinker and solve problems have a way to connect with them and also people who are willing to fund solutions like that, they can help, you know, incubate ideas and bring it uh, forward, um, you know, like with, with, and I, there's a bit of that starting, like the hacking health movement in Canada and some of the other, you know, dementia hack that you're seeing here and there. Uh, but I think there's more to be done with government support, universities, um, uh, private funding, uh, not-for-profit organizations to come closer together and work on, on the future of innovation. I really think that uh, if we have, you know, there's nothing, I, from my own personal experience, there's nothing I'd like more than to work with uh, healthcare practitioners and innovators in these technologies. I came from a technology background, but working with them and giving them a patient perspective, not just a, a clinician's expectations of what they're, what they think the patients are looking for, but a patient or a patient advisory group working with the manufacturers and the developers of these new products and really hitting, you know, the nail on the head, making sure that all of the needs are met and I think there you'll find a lot bigger bang for the buck as far as our health dollar costs. And in 2020, if we go into the future again, and on the capital side, working with uh, innovators, working with uh, the end, end users, that, that is a very active process right now, very, very active. I can give you a little bit of insight in one initiative, and it, it relates to a cluster plan that's being, we're, we're formulating a recommendation to the federal government and the provincial, Ontario government to um, revisit how they can support um, venture capital beyond that, private equity. Capital flows from all over the world into a cluster. The cluster is an idea of gathering a region, right? Maybe it's the Southern Ontario region. Um, also gathering a particular uh, sector, which is healthcare. Right? And then looking at it and saying, how do we support it with private capital and government capital? So the me mechanisms we're to toying with right now are the, the government side would be become the, uh, the lead investor. So it would commit a minimum amount of capital into uh, an initiative, which is healthcare, digital health, in a, in a cluster in Canada. And then the private side would come fivefold on top of that initial lead order, as we call it, and the initiative would be to work with innovators, would be working with the, uh, the healthcare sector, which includes, of course, the patient, and figuring out who, wh what initiatives, what capital initiatives, investment initiatives will become the winners in 2020. So it's the ruthless picking the winner is a bit of the problem for us, right? Um, because that's not that well, uh, it's not looked upon very, uh, positively, right, by rank and file, but sometimes it's necessary to make sure we do advance that. Okay. And Susan, I know you started our webcast and we've only got like a couple of seconds, so if you can be oh. quick. Let yeah, um, a lot of the discussion today has been about digital health focused on patient provider, patient health system. I just wanted to, to raise the specter that, you know, besides the patient, there's this broader audience of consumers because we're not always patients, we're not always seeking care, uh, but just that opportunity around a wellness journey yes. and a preventative health journey in terms of the digital health story, major, major impact in terms of the public. So 
Thanks to all the panelists today. A very exciting message. Yes. Thank you. And that's a great way to end our live portion of this. So I wish you all in uh, join me in thanking our speakers today. So they did a fantastic job. Thank you for everyone that joined us and participated in today's conversation. Digital health runs all week, as many of you know, and so right up until the 20th on Friday, we want you to continue the conversation. We have a series of events planned throughout the week to think uh, about digital health. You can learn more at betterhealthtogether.ca. Um, I think as was mentioned earlier, this Friday at 1 o'clock, we will keep the topic on the state of digital health in Canada. Uh, we'll keep that open and we'll have a tweet chat about it. So follow it with hashtag ThinkDigitalHealth. If you have posed a question and we didn't get to it in today's program, we'll come back to it on Friday during this event. So thank you to all of those that joined the webcast. We are signing off now and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. <laughs>